talk and he will talk about rigid co-cycles and singular moduli for real quadratic fields. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me all right? Fantastic. Okay. Thanks very much for the introduction and, and thanks uh, for the invitation also. It's really a great pleasure to be able to speak here. Um, so this course will be a short course, so there's only three lectures. And the main purpose is to give an introduction to the foundations of the theory of rigid co-cycles and its use uh, to give an attempted construction of singular moduli for real quadratic fields. Now, this theory hasn't been around for that long, only a couple of years. And uh, what I'll do here is I'll give a sort of friendly introduction to the foundations of the theory, which can really be made very elementary and very computational as well. Now, this is in sharp contrast with the increasing number of theoretical results that are emerging also in this area, um, which, in contrast, have kind of formidable prerequisites uh, to I I appearing in their proofs, and in particular the proofs of uh, special cases of some of the observations that we're about to make in this course. So instead, we'll take a very kind of elementary and computational approach in this course, the main idea, of course, being to embody as much as possible the spirit of this summer school, which is number theory informed by computation. And I very much hope to make it sufficiently concrete and computational for you to apply everything that you've learned so far in this summer school, all your skills with your favorite computer algebra system, and really uh, engage with this theory in a very concrete and examples-based way. Uh, to help you do that, there's a, a series of exercises which you can find online. And we have a problem session, first problem session later today, uh, so the official TA for that is James Rickards. I don't know if he's around, if you can raise your hand. Yeah, there he is. Uh, he'll be leading those sessions. There's also my student, Horvath Dam Johnson, who uh, knows a fair deal about these computations that go uh, into it. Uh, is, is he here? I don't know. Oh, there he is, yeah. So uh, those two people will be around, and you can ask them lots of questions. And I'll be around also. I encourage you to do so. OK, um, I think that should cover the practical side of things. If there are any questions, uh, please interrupt me. So today will be mostly motivational and including also some very classical background. And on Thursday and Friday, I will start in earnest with the rigid co-cycles. And I would like to begin today by discussing the first two words here in the subtitle, which is singular moduli. These boards really vibrate a lot, huh? Okay, I'll do my best. Uh, okay, so the values of the modular J function, which has appeared many times already, I think, in other courses, which I'll call Klein's J invariant, which is defined by a very explicit Q expansion. This is n cubed q to the n divided by 1 minus q to the n, where n is greater than or equal to 1. You'll recognize the Eisenstein series of weight 4 here, and I'll cube it and divide it out by the following infinite product, which defines the Ramanujan delta function. And if you expand this out as a q series, you obtain 1 over q plus 744 plus this magical number 196 884q, etc. And I can view this as a function on the Poincare upper half plane in the variable q being e to the 2 pi i tau. The sentence starts with the values. And I'll be interested in very specific values, namely those values of tau in the upper half plane, which satisfy a quadratic equation with integer coefficients. These are called CM points. So these are points in the Poincaré upper half plane, which I'll denote by age sub infinity, which is just a set of all complex numbers whose imaginary part is positive. So what about these values? I'll claim that they are arithmetically rich. which is not a mathematically very precise term. So let me try and point out a number of ways in which they are arithmetically rich, perhaps guided by a few basic examples, uh, most of which, I mean, the most 
standard ones are if you start by evaluating the j function at i, square root of minus 1, there's a unique such square root in the upper half plane, you get the number 1728, which appeared in many talks already, as well as the j invariant of a cube root of unity, which is 0, perhaps a slightly more interesting randomly chosen example is the j function evaluated at the square root of minus 15. And now I have to look at my notes, which I computed for you, is minus 5 squared times 3 cubed times this magnificent number, 637 plus 283 square root of 5, divided out by twice the square root of 5. Okay. Minus 15, sorry, this is not very clear. Thank you. Minus 15, exactly. Thank you. Now, there's two things I'll note about this number. Well, it's an algebraic number. It's an algebraic number that's defined over a different field than the argument that we fed into the J function. What that field is, I'll tell you in a second, and you probably already know. But I would like to point out two things. The first is that we can compute its norm. It's an algebraic number. And we can factorize that norm. And what we get is minus 3 to the power 6, 5 cubed, 11 cubed. This is a cube. So we obtain an integer. It's an algebraic integer. If we take its norm, we get an honest, rational integer. And if you factorize it, we find that it's extremely smooth. It's divisible only by very small prime numbers. Uh, to some large exponents. I'll also mention, because it'll come back potentially later, that it also has a trace. And that trace, well, you can kind of read it off from this, I guess, is minus 3 cubed, 5 squared times 283, which happens to be a prime number. OK? I'll get back to these two observations and why I bother telling you this about this particular J value. Now, classically, the reason people were very interested in these J invariants Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have a tendency to write very small, so please don't hesitate to remind me if I uh, exhibit some recidivism. So classically, and I'm talking now sort of late 19th century, they were notable because of their ability to generate ring class fields of imaginary quadratic fields. And class field theory was in full development in those days. Putting the singular moduli really center stage um, around the turn of that century. In this particular example, the relevant ring class field is just the Hilbert class field. For the imaginary quadratic field, Q joined the square root of minus 15, which is the field of definition of the argument that we plugged into the J function. And out came this number, which is contained in the Hilbert class field. Which in this case is, uh, is a genus field. It's a biquadratic field obtained by joining the square root of minus 3 and the square root of 5. Indeed, it generates that field over the imaginary quadratic field, um, the singular modulus does. So this is classically why people were very interested in these singular moduli. And uh, for a long time, I think, certainly up to and including World War II, the people had the feeling that this theory was really satisfactorily concluded. Now, a huge renaissance for singular moduli happened much later. And this came with the uh, very celebrated work of Gross and Zagier. Their first paper together dates from 1985. And what they did is something that looks very strange at first sight. They say 
take one singular modulus, j tau 1, that gives you such an interesting algebraic number that is uh, a generator for a ring class field. And now let's take another one of a discriminant that has nothing to do with the first one. Yeah? So j tau 1 minus j tau 2, where the discriminant of tau 1 is less than 0, and the discriminant of tau 2 is also less than 0. And in the paper of Gross and Zagier, the original paper, they required that these were co-prime and fundamental. What they did is this is an algebraic number, an algebraic integer. So you can take its norm, and that gives you an honest integer. And what they do in their paper is they give an explicit formula for what this integer is. Looks a little bit bizarre at first sight. But what is so fantastic about this discovery is that it led to really deep and very important developments. And the foundations of these discoveries, I mean, if there's anything that screams the theme of this conference, I think it's very much the, the origins of this work of Gross and Zagier. And uh, fortunately, Zagier had some um, significant birthday, I forget which one, a couple of years ago. And uh, Dick Gross gave a talk on the occasion of this birthday, and he made public also the letter that he received from Zagier in 1983 announcing some of these first discoveries. And this is such a wonderful document. So Gross says the following. He says, uh, singular moduli were studied intensively by the leading number theorist of the 19th century, as we remarked. Their algebraic integers, which generate certain abelian extensions of the imaginary quadratic fields. The theory was believed to have been brought to a very satisfying completion in the early 20th century. That was before Don got his hands on it. In early 1983, Don sent me an amazing letter from Japan containing a proof of a factorization formula for the integer, which is the norm of the difference of two singular moduli of relatively prime discriminants. This was a completely new aspect of the theory, which Don had discovered by extensive numerical experimentation. So that's very much in the spirit of this conference. And here you can see uh, this letter. It's very nice. I recommend anyone who hasn't seen it to, to look at it. It's really fun to read. Uh, and I'll read sort of the first page of it. And uh, you'll see in the exercises, the first exercise really is to try and recreate for yourself this moment of doing these numerical calculations and to actually spot some of the patterns without looking at the letter first and try and relive this moment, which seems like a very frivolous exercise. It's very ill-defined, uh, trying to find patterns and see if they match up with patterns that someone else found 40 years ago. But it's very instructive because later on in the third lecture, we'll do precisely that, but in the setting of real quadratic fields. And we'll try and mimic as much as possible that initial process of being guided by computations. So this is what Zagier writes. Dick, he says. I've been in Japan for two weeks now, and I'm enjoying it tremendously, both for sightseeing and mathematics. However, telling you about the trip can wait till you get to Germany. I'm writing now for mathematical reasons only. Um, yes, as you may remember, I had asked you whether our results might be generalized to result on the norm of the difference of singular moduli for arbitrary CM points, tau 1 and tau 2, with unrelated discriminants. You poo-pooed the idea, explaining why your method only applies to uh, two elliptic curves having CM by the same order. Not daunted, actually I was, I didn't do the calculations till now, I calculated the difference of singular moduli for many different examples of class number one. A somewhat tricky business, since my HP has only 10 places. And I found the values, and then he has some big table. Now already, I am just mesmerized by this letter, because, I don't know, I wasn't born, but in 1983, if you were going on a trip to Japan, I don't think people had laptops, so this HP with the 10 places he's talking about, I could only surmise he's talking about a, a calculator with sort of 10, I don't know, eh, but uh, this to me is, this is amazing, that he had a calculator with 10 places and worked out all of these tables. You have one? Fantastic, okay. So if you really want to be hardcore, you should do the first exercise for this course with only that HP. <laughs> That's for the really hardcore people. Other people can use a laptop, uh, and that also makes the exercise, I think, quite a bit more palatable because it doesn't sound like the most fun uh, obstruction to put yourself uh, under. Okay, 
Now, I want to highlight one table. So Zagier computes many things in this letter. And I'll just, uh, I'll just pick out sort of one example that we can stare at and try and explore a little bit together. It's the j value at 1 plus square root of minus 7 over 2. And I'll subtract the j invariant of 1 plus the square root of minus 43 over 2. Now, CM theory tells us that these are both integers. Yeah? So the norm is not necessary. It's already an integer. And that integer, when you factorize it, is 3 to the 6 plus 5 cubed, so times 5 cubed, rather, times 7 times 19 times 73. Okay? Again, very smooth number, which is quite remarkable because the J invariants themselves, as we already noted here, maybe this norm, they tend to be very smooth themselves. So we have the difference of two smooth integers, which is again very smooth. The ABC conjecture tells us that that sort of stuff shouldn't happen very often. Uh, luckily, there's only a finite number of examples here, so we can still believe in ABC if we want to. Now, this is, this is what Zagier does. Is he makes a little table. And here, I mean, of course, he had some foresight. So this is the part that will seem a little bit strange. Uh, but he had good reasons to be interested in those particular expressions. So what he's going to do is he's going to take x to be 1, 3, 5, 7, 9. Uh, that's probably enough. And then let's, let's make another one here of x going this time from 11, 13, 15, and 17. Okay. Now the expressions that he's going to compute for each of those x is the following. So it's 7 times 43, which is the product of the two discriminants of the CM points that we plug in, minus 7 and minus 43. But that's the same. You subtract x squared and you divide it by 4. And he's going to list all of the positive integers that are of that form. Right? So this can only happen for odd x's in this range. Yeah, so those are the only examples where this expression is a positive integer. So he computes those. So for instance, here we get 7 times 43, which is 301 minus 1 squared, which is 300, divided by 4, which is 75. Okay, so 75 is 3 times 5 squared. I'll just fill in the table. And you look at the numbers and see if you notice anything suspicious. So this is the table. Okay, who's willing to make a conjecture? Observation zero. Every prime factor that arises, so that divides the difference of these two singular moduli, seems to arise somewhere in this table. Correct? Okay, that seems to be true. Now conversely, that's not such a hot statement, it seems. Some of the prime factors that appear in this table do not appear on the left. Oh, so there's something wrong. Uh, because I probably made a horrendous mistake. 3 squared 5. Thank you. Yeah, this is the problem with uh, a board talk. And for this reason, I want to show you a huge amount of numbers later on. In the third lecture, there'll be slides. There's something else wrong. Uh, 13, I wrote, yes, this is a 3. Uh, I can claim that I meant to write a 3, but it, uh, this is just a mistake. This is a 3. Thank you. Let me scan again while you observe. Now, what Zagier goes on to do in his letter is, and he describes his thought process, which is very interesting, is he's trying to figure out which primes in this table actually do arise and to what multiplicity they arise. 
And he kind of walks you through his thought process. He comes up with a formula, and then he proves it in, uh, in this letter. He proves the formula exactly. And this first exercise is to try and do the same. Because by doing it, I think you'll have really the right reflexes when we get to the real quadratic case. So I highly recommend uh, doing that particular exercise. So that's what happens in that letter. Now, the rest is kind of history. Uh, Because Zagier challenges Gross in the letter to find a proof that's different from his proof, because his proof uses, uh, it's a very analytic proof, it uses families of Eisenstein series. Uh, it revolves around the families of Eisenstein series that was written down by Hecker about 100 years ago. And he challenges Gross to find an algebraic proof, which Gross does. So they give two proofs in their first paper, and later on, they combine the two into the contributions that the Archimedean and the non-Archimedean primes to a height pairing of Hegner points. And these results, they led, let me just say, and I'll say more about this in the final lecture, to progress on the Birch and Swinnett and Dyer conjecture. Relating the heights of Hegner points to the first derivative of the central value of the L function of an elliptic curve. So this is gross uh, Aguirre, 86. And then there's also gross Conan's Aguirre, 87. Yes, some question. Bigger, yes, thank you. OK, so the goal, this course, we'll try to do a very similar kind of experiment and to try and construct also by analytic means, but piadic analytic means, invariants that look very similar to the differences of singular moduli uh, at two CM points, where we replace these two CM points by a pair of RM points, so uh, real quadratic fields instead of imaginary quadratic fields. And so this course will aim to discuss the foundations of this theory. So real quadratic analogs and this is the, su the subject of rigid co-cycles and everything that I'll mention is joint work with Henri Darmont. Okay. All right. Before we do that, uh, it's important to also mention that we're certainly not the first ones to try this. And there's very there's alternative approaches that I should mention. And that you may have heard of, but they yield a very different set of invariants. So other approaches. have been explored. Of course, very famously, there is Stark's conjecture. So Stark's conjectures, they revolve around leading terms of L-series. And they can be seen as refinements of Dirichlet's class number formula. Now, the original conjectures of Stark were entirely Archimedean, so complex analysis. And it's interesting to note that since we're at a computational conference, if you're interested only in the very classical purpose of singular moduli, namely generating abelian extensions, the conjectures of Stark suffice entirely to solve this problem for real quadratic fields, even though they remain to this day completely conjectural. If you have a computer, you can assume they're true, get a result, and verify that that result is correct. And that's, in fact, what many 
uh, of the computer algebra packages do. Now, th what, the, what Star's conjectures um, come up with, the invariants they come up with are units. So they're very far removed from these singular moduli which have interesting prime factorizations, etc. Uh, so they're units, they're very, very different invariants. There's also a proposal of Manin uh, using non-commutative geometry, which is similar in spirit uh, to what happened in Stark. But that's even more speculative. There is also a non-Archimedean version of these conjectures of Stark. That's the piatic gross stark conjecture, which is a theorem. Uh, there's a recent work also of Dasgupta and Kakde, spectacular breakthrough in this area. And it produces also invariants that are algebraic and generate uh, abelian extensions of real quadratic fields and even more general totally real fields. But again, the invariants are very, very different. It's a piadic construction, and they construct p units. So again, there's no rich factorizations like there are in the differences of singular moduli, which is what led to all these other applications. So for the classical point of view, uh, there's also these other approaches that are worth mentioning. Another very interesting one to mention is to look at the J-invariant still, but the J-invariant you can't evaluate at a real quadratic argument because it lies just outside of the domain of the J-function. But what you can do is you can take, uh, you can take a, a real quadratic singularity and its conjugate and that defines for you a geodesic in the upper half plane. And you can consider cycle integrals of the J-function along such geodesics. And these numbers, they're very interesting, but they never appear to be algebraic. That didn't stop people. I mean, you, they can still be interesting if they're not algebraic. Uh, and so you can read, for instance, very interesting things about them in the work of Kaneko and also Duke, Imamoglu, and Toth. So I'd just like to mention also these alternative approaches. The invariants we construct go in a very different direction. They're orthogonal to these in many ways. And I'll focus, of course, on the rich factorizations that they exhibit. And I'll try and illustrate that as much as possible with explicit computations. And then we can try and guess some conjectures in the spirit of what Zagier does in his letter. OK. Any questions? While I check also how I'm doing on time. Ah, yes, quite a disaster. Yes, thank you. OK. Now, to explain and to start explaining uh, rigid co-cycles, I have to tell you a little bit about reduction theory for quadratic forms, which is a very classical subject. And that's what I want to do for the remainder of today's lecture. Uh, and everything here is very classical and goes back, essentially, to the work of Gauss. But in order to do explicit computations later, it's important that we get all of these definitions straight. Now, a quadratic form, for the purposes of this course at least, will mean an integral binary quadratic form. In other words, it's an element ax squared plus bxy plus c y squared. It's a homogeneous polynomial in two variables with integer coefficients, which I'll abbreviate quite often with this angle brackets notation, a comma b comma c. I'll say that such a quadratic form is primitive if the greatest common divisor of a, b, and c is equal to 1. Now, the set of quadratic forms is endowed with an action of SL2z. This is a right action. And 
it's an action by ring automorphism. Oops. On this polynomial ring ZXY, whereby a matrix PQRS in SL2Z, meaning PS minus RQ is equal to 1, sends X to Px plus Qy, and it sends y to Rx plus Sy. Now this action preserves the sets which I'll denote by curly F sub D and what these are, they're the primitive forms whose discriminant defined by b squared minus 4ac is fixed. Yeah, so these sets curly F sub D are respected or preserved or acted upon by this action of SL2Z. Okay. Okay, now the equivalence classes of this action, if I take primitive forms, uh, modulo this action of SL2Z of a fixed discriminant, there's a number of equivalence classes. And whenever this discriminant is not a square, which I might as well assume because we won't have much use, uh, at least in these lectures, for the square case, when it is not a square, there is a bijection between the SL2Z equivalence classes on FD for this action, so modulo SL2Z, with a group that nowadays we know as the narrow Picard group of Z D plus square root D divided by 2. So the quadratic order of discriminant D. We can look at its narrow Picard group. So it's a class group, but D need not be fundamental. So this is more traditionally denoted by Picard group in the narrow sense. So I quotient out modulo ideal equivalence uh, by principal ideals that are generated by a totally positive element. Now, what is this bijection? This bijection will take such a form, ABC, and it'll send it to the class of the invertible ideal generated by 2a comma minus b plus square root d. And this is a bijection. It was Gauss really who for the first time discovered that if you took equivalence of quadratic forms uh, with respect to this group SL2Z as opposed to the group GL2Z, which was more common at the time because people were thinking about other questions, then you actually get a group structure. And it's precisely this. Sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, D, D is a discriminant. Sorry, I didn't say that. Is that, is that what you mean? Yeah, sorry, I, I didn't say this, but uh, when D is a discriminant... Thank you. D is a discriminant and it's, and it's not a square. Yes. So whenever I write D, I implicitly mean that it's a discriminant in case I forget, but I'll try and remember. Thank you. Okay, now an important notion for us is to find within these equivalence classes distinguished representatives. And this is the classical topic of reduction theory.
we will define very special elements in these equivalence classes that are called reduced. Oh, yes, thank you. In fact, let me redo this. Thank you. So we define reduced forms uh, in two uh, separate cases. So we'll do this according to the sign of the discriminant D. Yes. The first case is when the discriminant D is less than zero. So these are what we call the definite forms. Now we say that a form ABC is reduced if the following condition, the following inequalities hold on the integers A, B, and C. So I want that B in absolute value is at most A, so this is less than or equal to A, and A, in turn, has to be less than or equal to C. And, at the same time, if equality happens in either of these two inequalities, then B must be positive. Sorry, is uh, so if equality holds. Yes, thank you. Um, it's true. I've been, I may have been a little bit not careful with the negative discriminants because we'll be talking about positive discriminants. And I think you are probably correct. Uh, you're completely correct. Um, so how do I fix this in the easiest way? So when D is negative, I will want to restrict to positive definite forms. Okay, yeah, maybe the easiest way to do now, because I'm on the board and I have to fix it somehow quickly to get to the rest of my material, is to just make D positive. Would that be a very offensive solution to you? This is the only case we will actually talk about, and I apologize for this oversight, uh, but you don't seem happy with this, uh, with this fix. <laughs> okay. Uh, Okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to make Hendrik unhappy. That's his, this is one of the things I would like to avoid doing today. But, but I also don't want to lose too much valuable right now, time on this. What's it's that? more important right now that you are happy. Yeah, well, okay, no, but sure. We should both be happy. There should be a nice that, that's compromise. That. Yes, that's that. Uh, okay. Um, uh, sorry, Hendrik. I, I'm very sorry. I'll make it up to you in other ways uh, afterwards. <laughs> Uh, so I hope that wasn't too confusing for people. It's true that it, there's, a, there's an oversight in that. If D is negative, you can look at either positive uh, valued forms, so they're definite, so they always have the same sign. And if the values are always positive or always negative, that creates another ambiguity of a sign, which I was not careful with uh, here. So this is a bit of a cop-out, but uh, in the notes I will make sure there's a more elegant way that hopefully makes uh, also Hendrik happy. Okay. Now, the most interesting case for us will be the positive case. And this positive case, those are the indefinite forms. We will say that a quadratic form ABC 
is nearly reduced. if a times c is less than zero. So if the integers a and c have opposite signs. Yeah. This is a slightly weaker notion than the notion of reduced, but it is the notion that is most important for what is to follow. We will say that it is reduced if, well, the same condition holds, and in addition, another condition holds, which is that b is greater than the absolute value of a plus c. Now this is a bit of a bizarre condition because you don't often find this condition in textbooks. The uh, general notion of reducedness is defined in a slightly more complicated way, but it's entirely equivalent to this statement. And this is not really so well known, um, but it is a definition that I'll take because it's for computational purposes very pleasant and very interesting because it's so simple and much simpler than the notion that you typically see. Okay. Okay. Very good. Now, another definition that we'll need frequently is when we have a quadratic form whose discriminant is non-square, then it has what we'll call a first and a second root. Or roots. And the first root, which I'll denote by r, In fact, let me just define it on the primitive ones, which is all that we'll need. It will be a complex number attached to A, B, C, and it's the root B plus square root of D divided by 2A, where the convention is, of course, that when D is positive, this uh, square root of D is picked to be a positive real number. The second root will have to be the conjugate of that. Which is this root. Now, these definitions that I've made of reducedness, they can be phrased, and perhaps they're a bit more palatable, when they are phrased in terms of the roots. And this is one of the exercises you will find in the notes as well as the check that that unorthodox definition of reducedness in the indefinite case agrees with the ones uh, that you find in other textbooks. So I'll just mention here maybe that reducedness can be rephrased in terms of roots, C exercises. Okay. All right, a couple of final remarks. Let's see how I'm doing on time, okay. Uh, I'm going very quickly through all of this uh, more classical material. One thing that you may not have encountered before, but which I'll mention, because it can be useful if you're somewhat more visually inclined, is uh, the topograph, which is a, a certain tree that was introduced by Conway in his book, The Sensual Quadratic Form. And you don't need the topograph, but if you know the topograph, and if you're a little bit handy with visualizing things in terms of the topograph, many of the algorithms and ideas, and even lemmas and proofs that appear also in the literature, a little bit easier to find if you know about the topograph. So I'll just put it out there. I probably won't mention it again. But uh, if you contemplate the topograph a little bit, you might get certain ideas more easily. Certainly, it has helped me a lot in my life. 
so Conway considers a tree. And I'll denote this tree by curly T for topograph. And what it is, is it's the inverse image of the J invariant of the segment on the real line between 0 and 1728. Okay, so we already saw the J invariant 0 and 1728 were very special. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to take the real interval and I'm going to look at all of the elements in the upper half plane that map to that closed interval within the real numbers between 0 and 1728. Yes? Okay, so what does that look like? So this is the upper half plane up here. This is the real axis, which is just not included in the upper half plane. And we know already that I and the six roots of unity that lie in the upper half plane will lie in this inverse image. And in fact, if you look at the whole inverse image, you will see that you get a very nice arc. This is not a very accurate drawing. Uh, it's, a, it's a circle arc, which of course, since the J invariant is invariant under translation, repeats like so. And then it descends down via all the SL2Z images of that same arc or that same hyperbolic geodesic. And let me attempt to draw part of this topograph for you in a way that's, uh, that looks somewhat uh, appetizing. This keeps on repeating, where the ends get closer and closer and closer to the real axis. I'll stop there at this depth, but you can keep going and you can imagine what the picture looks like. So this is what the tree T is. This is what the topograph is. Now what can I do? I can take a quadratic form, F, and in fact let me illustrate it here on the following quadratic form, F, which is 1, 1, minus 1 whose discriminant is 5. And what I can do is I can take the connected components of the upper half plane minus this tree, so the complement of this tree. There's infinitely many connected components, each of which is adjacent to a unique cusp, a unique element of P1, Q. What I'm going to do is I'm going to label oops, f r comma s, where I think of my quadratic form, which has two variables, x and y, and I evaluate them at r comma s for x and y respectively, where this r comma s is the cusp in P1Q, which is uniquely defined by the fact that it's adjacent to this connected component. And of course, it's an element of P1Q, so it's well defined up to scaling. And I will take R and S to be co prime integers. So in lowest terms, with the usual conventions. Okay. Now if I do this on this particular one, the unique adjacent cusp to this region up here is infinity, which in lowest terms is represented by 1, 0. The sign is fixed to be positive in the first coordinate. So if I evaluate this at 1, 0, I just get 1. I don't know if I have colors, actually. No, there's, anyway, it doesn't matter. So the number one appears in this particular region. Yeah. Down here, so let me center it so that the cusp zero 
corresponds to this region down here. Uh, that's going to correspond to 0, 1, and so I get a minus 1 filled in here. And if I keep doing that, I get the following sequence of numbers up to the depth that I have drawn. So there's minus 1, minus 5, minus 1, 11. Here there is 1, minus 5, minus 11, minus 11, minus 5, 1, 19, 31. And let me stop there so I can keep going deeper and deeper, and you'll see um, more and more interesting numbers, but let me, let me stop there. Now, this can very often guide your intuition, especially when it comes to reduction theory for indefinite forms. Again, if you're algebraically inclined, you don't need it. But for those of you that find this useful, it can be useful. Uh, Conway introduces this notion of the river, which for an indefinite quadratic form consists of all of those edges of the topograph that lie between a positive region and a negative region. And positive and negative, of course, referring to the label. So here you see, so now I'll try and draw it in big kind of, uh, I don't know if this is very visible, but uh, imagine this is blue or something. It's a river, so that seems appropriate color for, for it. Here also, I'm dividing between 1 and minus 1, minus 1 and 1, so here I keep going uh, to the left, etc. I don't know if this is very visible, but you can see here that some, some infinite path in this tree is being determined by this quadratic form, and this is what Conway calls the river. So you, you can think of quadratic forms um, so here, the quadratic form, of course, the A and the C appear as the regions labeled here. And if I let SL2Z act on this form, all of these other numbers are going to show up, coming from the fact that SL2Z is going to move one of these edges to the standard edge here in the middle. And so it's a way of visualizing, really, the entire SL2Z orbit of one quadratic form, and it's often convenient when we deal with reduced forms and nearly reduced forms in this language. So if it's helpful to you, try and think in terms of the topograph about all of this reduction theory, especially uh, the reduction algorithm, which I'm about to state, and see if it's, uh, if it's for you, and if it can mean anything for your intuition. Okay, now, the final thing I want to mention And this is really the, the only case that we'll look at in this course. So these are going to be positive and non-square. So define for some form f in the set curly f sub d. So this is, again, a discriminant. I didn't say this. Let me write it as I promised. It's a primitive dis uh, quadratic form of discriminant D, which is positive and non-square. I'll call it F. And I define the following set, sigma sub F, to be the set of all nearly reduced forms in the SL2Z orbit of this F. So it's all of the ABC that are equivalent under this action of SL2Z, which I'll denote by a tilde here, to the original form F, for which A times C is less than zero. Yeah? So the nearly reduced forms that we introduced earlier. Now this set will play a, a large role in, uh, in what's going to happen later on with rigid co-cycles. And one of the exercises is to try and compute it for a couple of forms f. Now, if you're familiar with the topograph, for instance, it's, it's quite easy to see that every SL2Z orbit contains at least one nearly reduced form. And it's also very easy to see that the number of nearly reduced forms is finite. Because if A times C is negative and B squared minus 4AC is a fixed integer D, there's finitely many possibilities for the A, Bs, and Cs. And so therefore this set is clearly finite. It's also non-empty. You can think about why this is true. Alternatively, you could try and explicitly construct an element in this set for a given F. And so I'll just mention, I uh, hope I have a little bit of time. Okay, so I have three minutes to do this. 
that it can be computed efficiently. So note that SL2Z is generated by two matrices, S and T. T is the name I'll give to this matrix 1101. One, one. Well, I might as well write the zero. And S is the matrix minus 1, 1, zero, zero. These two matrices together generate SL2Z. And how do they act on quadratic forms? A, B, C, by the matrix T, which is translation, is going to be sent to A. Well, the A doesn't change at all. The B is going to change by twice A, so it's B plus 2A. And the C is just going to be the sum of A, B, and C, which follows straight from the definition. Likewise, if I apply S to A, B, C, I end up getting the quadratic form C minus B A. Now given some quadratic form F, like the F that I started off with there, You can now find a reduced form in its orbit by doing the following procedure. So the first step is you can apply a power of t to make sure that b, you see you can change b with a multiple of 2a, so you can put it in any fixed interval of size 2a with maybe one of the endpoints excluded. Uh, and the intervals that we will choose here, slightly different from the intervals that, uh, that Gauss chose. We're going to apply the unique power of t. To ensure that the coefficient b is going to be at most the absolute value of the coefficient a. And it's going to be strictly bigger than minus the absolute value of the coefficient a. So that's the interval I'm going to put it in, at least in those cases where a is greater than or equal to the square root of d. If not, if a is less than the square root of d, I'm going to put it in a different interval. I'm going to put it in this interval, square root of d. And here I'm going to take as my lower bound the square root of d minus 2a to get the length of the interval uh, correct. This is the first step. The second step is to check, well, if my form is reduced, then I stop. If not, apply S and return to 1. And you can keep repeating this until you hit a reduced form. Now, you can show, entirely algebraic here if you like, that this procedure stops. It even stops after a very small number of steps, roughly uh, it's big O of the logarithm of A over the square root of D. Uh, it doesn't really matter. It, it finishes after a fixed number of steps that is easy to control. And once we have a reduced form, We can find all the nearly reduced forms in a very similar way. And one of the exercises is to work this out and to apply it to a number of examples. Okay, so. Uh. Compute the set sigma f with a similar procedure. See exercises.
Now, for indefinite forms, which is uh, the case that we'll be interested in for the work on real quadratic singular moduli, this set sigma f shows up time and time again. So I recommend you to compute it in a couple of examples to really familiarize yourself with it. And next time, I will show you that starting from these sets sigma f, you can construct these really bizarre objects called the Knopp co-cycles, which were constructed by Knopp in the late 70s, and which will um, construct a piadic analog of that will produce invariants for us that seem to experimentally uh, mimic very closely all of the properties that were observed by Gross and Zagier for differences of singular moduli before. So next time on Thursday, I will pick it up and I'll use this reduction theory to define these co-cycles for you. And then on Friday, I'll show you lots and lots and lots of data and we'll try and recreate this uh, moment where we come up with some conjectures based on numerical computations very similar to what we saw in the letter of Zagier. So with that said, I think I'll stop. I, I'm sorry for going a couple minutes over time, and thanks very much. I have time for a quick question.